Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be looking at a condition called diabetes insipidus. Now, this is a different diabetes than the one that we're all used to hearing about, which is diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus has to do with the hormone insulin. We know that in type 1 diabetes, the body has lost its ability to synthesize and make insulin. And then in type 2 diabetes, the body's lost its sensitivity to insulin. This is a different kind of diabetes. And when you see diabetes insipidus, you need to think water balance. And specifically, this condition is an insufficient synthesis and release of a hormone called vasopressin, also called antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, by the posterior pituitary. So let's first review a little bit of the normal physiology here. So up here at the top of the picture, we have the hypothalamus, part of the brain. It's right below the thalamus, right? Part of the diencephalon. And then descending down from that, we have the pituitary structure. And the pituitary structure is composed of two parts. This one in lighter pink, I believe, is meant to be the anterior pituitary, which is glandular. It's also called the adenohypophysis. Adeno meaning glandular and hypophysis referring to pituitary. And then this one in darker pink here is the posterior pituitary, also called the neurohypophysis. The hypothalamus is connected to the posterior pituitary by a system of axons right here. So in the hypothalamus, there's two major hormones that are synthesized. Those are oxytocin and vasopressin, also called ADH. Those are then transported uh, by axonal transport down to the axon, uh, which is located in the posterior pituitary. And then when we have the appropriate electrical signal by the brain, this axon fires, you have an action potential, and then these hormones are released from the posterior pituitary. One of them would be oxytocin, which is in males, but it's more commonly functioning in females. The male equivalent, which has other functions at the kidney, is antidiuretic hormone or ADH. Now, a lot of sources will call this vasopressin. When you're talking about it in the context of the vasculature, this is the more common term to use. But when we're talking about it in the context of the kidneys, ADH is the better term or antidiuretic hormone. So ADH is gonna travel in the blood. It's a hormone, right? And it's gonna to go to the kidneys right here. Now let's think about the name antidiuretic hormone. Well, it's anti-diuresis. So what is diuresis? Diuresis is urination. So if we're anti-diuresis or anti-diuretic, that means it's going to function in slowing down or stopping urination so that we can hold on to water. Okay. So let's see what's happening here at the level of the nephron. So the action of antidiuretic hormone is really at the distal part of the nephron in the collecting duct right here. Remember, here's our glomerulus up here in the renal corpuscle, proximal convoluted tubule, here's our loop of Henle, here's the distal convoluted tubule, and then antidiuretic hormone is mainly going to function in those collecting ducts. So right here we have a blow up of those collecting ducts. So here you have the ductwork cells that make up the duct. And then we have the lumen of the ductwork right here, the lumen of the tubule. And then over here is the blood where we might reabsorb or secrete certain substances. Okay. So when antidiuretic hormone acts on the collecting duct cells right here, it stimulates them to insert aquaporins in both sides of their membranes. Okay. So here's one cell right here. And you can see that aquaporins are inserted into the side of the membrane that faces the tubule and then the side of the membrane that actually leads to the blood. There's aquaporins on both sides. Now what aquaporins do is they allow the movement of water. So of course the filtrate in here that will eventually be uh, shuttled out into the urine is largely water. But if we didn't have these aquaporins here, we'd have a lot more water rushing through and we'd lose water from the blood. So in order to maintain blood volume, we need to reabsorb this water back into the blood. Okay, So the water is going to be in the tubule system here in the collecting ducts, and it's going to be transported first across this aquaporin into the cell here, and then across the other aquaporin, and this will take it ultimately back to the blood. And this helps to maintain blood volume. Okay. You also see here that compared to the previous picture, I made the urine a little bit yellower or darker. OK, 
Okay? If you think about that, that's because if we're removing water from the tubule, uh, that's going to mean that we're going to have a higher solute concentration in the filtrate. And so your urine that you see in the toilet would be more yellow. But in any case, that water is pulled into the blood, and this helps maintain blood volume and euhydration. Okay? Now what happens if we have a deficiency of antidiuretic hormone? Well, that is what diabetes insipidus is. We have insufficient release of ADH from the posterior pituitary. So there's less ADH that acts on the kidneys collecting ducts, right? And so what do you think that's going to do to the amount of aquaporins here in the membranes of these cells that line the collecting ducts? Well, there's going to be less aquaporins, as you see right here. And so is water going to be able to be reabsorbed very well in the collecting ducts? No. Now, there is water that's absorbed everywhere else here. There is some in the, in the proximal convoluted tubule, some in the distal. There's a ton in the loop of Henle. But the collecting ducts allow a strong regulation on water balance. And so without that ADH here, we're not going to be able to absorb that last bit of water here from the filtrate. And so that water is just going to end up being passed into the urine. That also means it's not going to be reabsorbed into the blood here. So what's the blood volume going to do? The blood volume is going to drop. And this means that the person is going to be more prone to dehydration. Because the water is not going back into the blood, it's going into the toilet. And so people with diabetes insipidus will often present with polyuria. They're going to have excessive urination. Why? Because they're not able to reabsorb this water back into the blood. It just simply passes through the collecting ducts, into the renal pelvis, and then out into the urethra and the toilet, right? As a result of this polyuria, they're going to be dehydrated. And when the body is dehydrated, the brain senses this and stimulates the thirst centers. But because they're going to be dehydrated all the time, they're going to be thirsty all the time. And that's going to be this polydipsia. So you have this vicious cycle of polyuria, dehydration, polydipsia. Then you drink the fluid and then you pee it out. Polyuria, dehydration, polydipsia. Now you could imagine that being chronically dehydrated is going to lead to fatigue and irritability. But also because the blood is going to have a lower water concentration because it's not being reabsorbed to the blood, it's staying in the filtrate, the serum or the blood is also going to have an increased sodium concentration. Think about it. The collecting ducts here don't have any function for reabsorbing sodium. It's just water. So if we're not reabsorbing water here, we're going to have less water in the blood. And so that means a higher ratio of sodium to water. So higher serum sodium concentration. And then in terms of the filtrate, what will become the urine, it's going to be much clearer. Notice the difference between normal function of ADH and diabetes insipidus. Now we have that water remaining in the filtrate, so the urine is going to be much more clear. And so there's going to be a much higher ratio of water to all the solutes. And so this would be referred to as a decreased urine-specific gravity. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the signs and symptoms of diabetes insipidus and also the pathophysiology relative to normal physiology. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.